a lot of people, including many scientists, seem pretty confident that aliens have to exist somewhere in the universe. Is that just wishful thinking? Or can you actually calculate whether intelligent aliens exist? UFO sightings and Area 51 rumors aside, we have never seen an alien, never heard an alien, or had any kind of verifiable indication that they're out there. So how do you estimate how many intelligent aliens you should see when you've never actually seen any with probability and statistics? We just need to get a handle on the factors at play in the emergence of intelligent life as we know it. So where do we start? Well, the Milky Way galaxy has about 200 billion stars. Based on recent analyses of exoplanet data, we can now also estimate, without totally guessing, how common planets are that might support life. It looks like it's around one habitable planet per star on average. So, 200 billion stars, 200 billion habitable planets. Now for the unknowns. We need to know what percentage of the habitable planets would actually sprout life, and then what percentage of those life-sprouting planets would evolve intelligent species. Multiply these two probabilities by the 200 billion planets, and voila, you know how many Wookiees or Covenant or Vulcans you should expect. What I've just described is similar in spirit to what's called the Drake Equation. The details are different since Drake, the founder of SETI, was estimating the number of detectable alien radio signals, but the overarching logic is the same. Anyway. If we get the odds of intelligent life, we're golden, but here's the problem. Whenever anyone, even a scientist, quotes a number for the probability of life arising, it's pretty much a complete guess. How come? Because the only place we've ever seen so much as an amoeba is Earth. We have no clue how frequently life sprouts, much less intelligent life, because we have a whopping sample size of one. So is this game over? Is it impossible to take a rational, statistical, scientific position on whether or not aliens exist? Not exactly. There are sensible arguments both for and against the existence of aliens. They rely on other numbers that we can calculate mixed in with a bit of logic. None of those arguments is decisive, so I'll present you with simplified versions of some of the most famous ones and let you be the judge. Let's start with a pro-alien argument that intelligent life should exist. The argument says, look, 200 billion habitable planets, that's a huge number, so huge that it should compensate even for crazy low odds of intelligent life arising on any one of them. The late great Carl Sagan was a big proponent and popularizer of this viewpoint. Here's an analogy. Suppose the odds of sprouting Daleks was as low as the odds of winning the Powerball jackpot with a single ticket. That's about 1 in 175 million. You would still expect over 1,000 alien civilizations in our galaxy by now. If the chances of intelligent life evolving are even lower, well, 200 billion is just the number of habitable planets in our galaxy. If we sweep nearby galaxies into our planet count, we can add trillions more planets to compensate. And that is Sagan's point. If the odds of intelligent life were so insanely low that you couldn't compensate with billions or trillions of habitable worlds, it would start to look like a cosmic conspiracy, like Earth and humanity are absurdly special. And scientists hate special, any kind of special. Our whole model of the universe, dating back to Copernicus, is rooted in the democratic notion that our planet, our sun, our galaxy, none of them are special. The Sagan view then is not that alien life is guaranteed, it's that the alternative is so contrary to a closely held scientific principle that it's quite difficult to swallow. Pretty persuasive? Well, as it turns out, there's a way to turn this argument entirely on its head. One prominent no aliens argument begins by pointing out that our galaxy is not just very big, but also very old, about 10 billion years old. So say you grant Sagan logic. Taken to its conclusion, there should have been not only enough places for intelligent life to arise, but also enough time for at least some of that life to spread around the galaxy. That a species would spread out isn't some crazy assumption on our part. Remember, our species, which is only about 200,000 years old, has already sent the Pioneer and Voyager probes out of the solar system. In fact, with current propulsion technologies and no fancy sci-fi stuff, we could send probes or robots across the whole galaxy. Yeah, it would take us 20 million years or so, but so what? The galaxy is 10 billion years old. That's a blink of an eye. Our more advanced future selves might need even less time to do this, and we're just one species on one planet. So, given how old the galaxy is, shouldn't there be evidence of at least one other such species that's jetted around the cosmos? Something like radio signals, space stations, probes, a broken down Millennium Falcon, I don't know, an alien drink Pepsi sign, something. But we've seen squat. We've seen exactly zero evidence of current intelligent aliens or residual evidence of extinct ones. Now, if our ability to send stuff into space isn't special, and alien intelligence really is inevitable on the billions and billions of habitable planets, then where are the aliens? Or at least, where's their stuff? This argument was put forth by the physicist Enrico Fermi, among others, and it now bears his name, the Fermi Paradox. The punchline is that precisely because we don't see aliens, the odds of intelligent life must be, wait for it, astronomically low. 
Now you can, of course, explain the Fermi paradox away, but it's never totally satisfying. Maybe aliens hate exploring space? Okay, but all of them? It only takes one. One Klingon Richard Branson to hop around the galaxy and leave some kind of a trace. Maybe we're not looking in the right places? Sure, but remember the numbers here. The galaxy is 10 billion years old, and humanity, right now, would only need 20 million years to spread all over. And we're not special, right, Saganites? So someone should have left something even in our little corner of the galaxy. Huh. So it seems like choosing between the Sagan and Fermi camps comes down to deciding which of two unlikely things you think is less unlikely. That intelligent alien life never evolves on the billions of possible planets, or that intelligent aliens evolve, none of whom ever spread out in any observable way in the 10 billion year history of the galaxy. There is an interesting third option, a way for them both to be right without having to invoke weird coincidences, but it's a little depressing. It's an argument that also has many proponents, but it's been articulated especially nicely by Oxford University philosopher Nick Bostrom. Here's the idea. Maybe the odds of intelligent life arising are pretty decent, but the odds of intelligent life going extinct before it can spread into the galaxy are also high. There very well might be an evolutionary great filter that works against intelligent species. It could be something natural, like a virus or Godzilla, or species made, like a nuclear holocaust or out of control nanobots, but something that would tend to wipe any intelligent species off the cosmic map, including, unfortunately, us. But hey, extinction extinction, right? At least you can sleep better knowing that it's possible to reconcile Sagan's billions and billions argument with the fact that Chewbacca wasn't at your office holiday party. Anyway, now you know how legit scientists and scholars handle the question of space aliens. So, what do you think? Give us your two cents in the comments. I'd like to hear which side of the fence you find yourself on. Alien abduction stories, also welcome, with proof. I'll report any interesting findings on the next episode of Space Time. Last week we asked, what planet is Super Mario World? Let's see what you guys had to say. D. Moritz found that Sonic the Hedgehog lives on a planet with about 5.6 Earth Gs. Closer to a planet, good work. Gaetan commented, science. That's correct. The gentleman physicist points out that Super Mario World could be a platform accelerating through space with rockets at 70 meters per second squared. And it could be, but think about how much fuel it would take to keep that acceleration going. Nicholas Feely suggests that maybe Mario is on a black dwarf. Cool idea, but you're off by about 100,000 Gs. And James Morgan? you keep regulating. Hey, thanks to everybody who watched and blogged about the debut episode. Remember, you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. We'll see you guys next week. And hey, subscribe already. Don't make me send this guy after your cat.